Plus, I was late, so that should make things better. Uh, so, more fumbling will ensue. Uh, announcements, uh, Checkpoint 2 is due today, uh, so don't forget about it. Uh, next Friday is when the actual project is due. Uh, if you're interested in the course assistant uh, stuff, that's the sign up QR code. Um, you can also, I think I was supposed to post it to Piazza and I think I forgot, um, but I'll try to remember to post it to Piazza as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out uh, was there's an event called Demo Day, which is basically all of the Spark classes. So the, the Spark series of classes are all about doing actual projects in the actual real world. Uh, some of them are data science related, some are machine learning related, some are uh, kind of general software engineering related. And on the 5th of May, so basically, I guess the day after the last day of classes, um, there is a big event where uh, like a selection of the projects are put on display. Uh, and it's at uh, GSU. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, on the floor above where all the food is, uh, there's actually a conference center. So it's actually in that conference center. That's the sign up link, um, but it's from 5 to 8 p.m. on, like I said, it's the kind of day after classes are over. Uh, so I think it's a Thursday. Um, two of my classes will be presenting there as well as uh, a whole bunch of others. Uh, I think there's a neighborhood of just from Spark, there's 40 projects or something that will be shown. Um, but then all the other cross college challenge classes that are not related to Spark are also uh, kind of demoing stuff there too. Uh, so it should be interesting, especially if you want to see projects that students like you uh, have worked on um, and uh, you know kind of get ideas for the future uh, if you're interested. All right. So a little bit of a recap. Um, first up, we have a question. Uh, that is related to the reading, uh, which is, what was the range of values used in the example to further explain standard deviation? And the choices are 0 to 1, 25 to 31, and 65 to 85. All right, get those answers in. And I'm going to close the answers down. And the correct answer was zero to one. Uh, so in case it wasn't obvious, um, I want to, I'm going to start introducing questions about the prior readings. Uh, so uh, please make sure you're keeping up with them. It makes a big difference uh, to uh, your understanding of the topic and of the class. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be more useful questions going forward. Uh, but that was the best one I could come up with. All right. So I wanted to give another further example of kind of standard units. Uh, and so specifically, Let's imagine we had two tests, okay? And we had one test where most of the students, right, did really pretty close to the same score, right? They, like, it only varied from 67 to 72, right? And then we had another test where the grades were from 50 all the way to 90, okay? So these two, you know, they're the same thing, but with wildly different distributions, right? And so these are very difficult to compare even though they kind of look similar, it's hard to know how similar they actually are because the, the fluctuation is so different, right? So the variability on this one versus the variability on that one are wildly different. So in order to simplify that and make it so that we can compare them, and let's say we want to figure out how the students did for all the tests across a course, we can use standard units. And so, when we do this, it becomes significantly more obvious what their relationship is, okay? And so you can now tell kind of by, somewhat by glancing at it, but you can also now do simpler math to figure out 
what's the relationship between this is the first test, right, and the second test. And we can kind of see them make a, it just makes it so we can now compare them to each other. And so basically we just figure out the standard units uh, so that we can take both sets of data and put them in kind of the same scale, right? Does that make sense? All right. So in order to do standard units, we will click a number of times to try to get the next slide. So basically the average of the standard united, you know, data, right, is going to be a zero with a standard deviation of one, okay? And then that means that 96% of the values of Z will, between, will be between minus five and five, right? In other words, in five standard deviations, okay? But remember when we say like two standard deviations, we usually mean two on one side and two on the other. So really it's four, right? If you kind of count the whole thing. Um, but so the standard deviation and standard units will come in handy a lot. So there's how, oh, and then here's the calculation to get the actual uh, standard units. Um, you take the value, any given value, right? Subtract the average, and then we divide it by the standard deviation of the original data set. All right. So how do you calculate the standard unit? All right, get those answers in. All right, closing it there. And the correct answer is the value minus the average divided by the standard deviation. Another question, when Z is negative, where is it in relation to the average? So this was on the slide, but I don't think I said it out loud. Is this the, if Z is negative, is it above the average, below the average, or exactly the average? All right, let's call it there. And correct, the below the average is the correct answer. Um, so if Z was zero, it would be exactly the average. If it's positive number, it means it's to the right of the average or it's above the average, sorry. All right, so I wanna show another thing about the normal distribution because uh, I think I wanted to, you know, basically what I wanna do is try to show a, a better graphic for it. Uh, so we talked last time about the normal distribution and we talked about this arc, right? That looks like a bell curve, okay? Or it looks like a bell and it's a curve. So therefore a bell curve. Um, but what I wanted to show, because I thought it might be better with a kind of a graphic was explaining where that inflection point is so you know where the first standard deviation is. <clears throat> so this pink part is basically where the inflection point happens. And I was reading somewhere or whatever that a way to think about it is like, you have the top curve, right? And as soon as it starts to bend out into the other curve, okay? Because it's almost like it's two pieces, right? There's this part curving down, and then there's this part that's gonna kind of curve up, right? Or it, it looks like it's gonna curve up. Um, so right when it switches types of curves is the inflection point. And so this is useful if you wanna get a, a guess, right? About where, uh, where that standard deviation is. And so, you know, if we draw an imaginary line down, I don't know how, how lined up my little lines are, but you get the idea. 
Um, you draw a little line down, right? And you see it's about, I don't know, 61 maybe, and maybe 67 over here. And that tells you where that, where, you know, a one standard deviation, one standard deviation, right? Does that make sense? And then we also have the standard normal distribution, which is basically when we're doing that standard unit stuff. And so everything is wrapped around zero, right? And so we can see F minus one, assuming I drew my little picture right because I drew this by hand. Uh, actually, this should line up to the minus one. It's a little bit off. Um, and then this should line up to one. Uh, and that would be that's the inflection point, basically. Okay, so just kind of two different ways of looking at it. You know, my drawing is not the best in the entire world, but there it is. <coughs> All right. And so, again, we can use that as a pointer <coughs> to figure out where the standard deviations are, at least the first one. Uh, but once we know the first one, right, we can then just add and get the rest. Yeah. Uh, let me go back. So, oh yeah, I guess it did come out that way, didn't it? Uh, no, that's an accident of drawing. Um, yeah, to an extent. Um, but basically, it's, you go by the inflection point. I'm using a normal distribution here, so it will be. But in the case of more typical, uh, you know, like a kind of a, a more an uglier data set, um, it's just where this is, and it's going to be. Some, you know, somewhere in there. Yeah, so I probably should have had an example where I didn't use a normal distribution. Yeah. Well, that, so the X value, yes. Like not this point, this point. So this is the standard deviation. This is one standard deviation, and this is one. Let me show the next thing. Sorry. So between the center and that inflection point is one standard deviation. So to get to two standard deviations, right, you just take that and add to it, and you'll get to this next standard deviation. Make sense? All right, and then this is the Chebyshev's bounds. And so basically, this gives you an idea of how much of your data will fall, how many standard deviations away. And remember, it's an at least, right? So in two standard deviations, I could have all the data, theoretically, uh, but, but I will have at least 75%. And again, when we say two standard deviations, we mean, in this case, Two, like two on either side, right? So that's why it says plus or minus. Um, so in a sense, right, it's four standard deviations, right? It's either two on the right and two on the left of your center or the average. All right, and now there's a question. All right, the range of st five standard deviations above and below the average encompasses what proportion of the distribution? Or at least, technically. And this is an important one to know just because it comes up a lot. All right, get those answers in. All right, well, so you got it, 96%. All right, so now moving on to the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem, which is usually abbreviated to CLT, 
Okay, so if I say CLT, that's what I mean. Um, describes how the normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve, is connected to random sample averages. And why do we care about that? Because we can estimate population averages. So, I feel like, am I supposed to be doing a demo by now? Not quite. Sorry? Did it say that? Okay. Aha! That's why. I got confused. Oh, boy. Now I broke it. Okay, so let me do a demo. Why is this not going away? All right, so, oh, actually, let me try to run this. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is load this uh, table of uh, United Airline flight delays. Okay, so it's the number of minutes after uh, they were scheduled to leave uh, and when they actually left. Um, however, Goodness, everything is really broken today. Come on. All right, so the first thing we want to look at, uh, mostly for the sake of this exercise, is how big a table is that. So we can say united dot num rows, right? And we get 13,825 rows. So, what we then wonder is, okay, if we had a, if we had a population, so if we had a number of rows of only seven, how many, how many possible samples are there if the sample was two, okay, if we're doing with replacement? So, anybody know how I might do the math to figure out how many different options I would get? Uh, not quite. So it's this, a sample size of two. Yeah, so it's the number of combinations. So yes, as you get into more sophisticated kinds of combinations. So this one's actually relatively easy. Um, but we just raise... We just take the, the number of things and raise it to the power of the sample size, okay? And so we end up with seven times seven, um, but it's 49. Uh, and so the reason I didn't want to say seven times seven is because it's, actually, I didn't really think about it because it's raised to the power of two, but it's raised the, the sample size. So obviously, I don't care that much about that. We care about this united scenario, right? So if we want to say united, num rows for our po total population, and we raise that to a sample size of 100, that, that's, that's a lot of samples, right? That's a lot of possible samples, okay? And remember the key here being is that in this case, we're talking about with replacement. So as a result, um, there's more, right? Because we're putting them back in after we choose it than there would be as if we were doing without replacement. So then, but 100 samples, right, in most of our examples so far is not great, right? So instead, we want to do something like, let's say, 400 samples. And so we do basically the same thing. But this time we raise it to 400, and that's a really, really big number. All right, anybody know why it doesn't give a scientific notation for this? Guesses? Basically because they're all 
important numbers. So there's not like there's not a lot you can collapse in there uh, without actually wanting to collapse it. Um, okay, so that was a big number. So, but we want to understand this data set. So, did I set United Bins? Yeah. Um, so, as you can see, it, while there are delays, we can see that there's delays that probably go out like somewhere in the 250 to 300 range of minutes. Okay, but there's so few of them, we can't even see the, the stack, right? That's kind of what happens starting about 150. There's, there's so few compared to the rest of the scale that we can't even see them. Um, but as you can see, the vast majority of the delays are actually right up here at the front, right? So, you know, one to one to three minutes or zero to three minutes, basically. But we can do that a little bit more with a little bit more sophistication by actually looking at the values. So we can look at the average of the uh, delays, right? And we get about 16, 16.7, give or take, um, minutes. And then we get a standard deviation, right, of 39.4. Okay, so I just said, right, that most of them were actually kind of in the zero to three range, right? So what's going on here? Why do we have an average that's so high? Yeah, so those outliers out here are having a pretty hefty impact on our average, okay? Also, by extension, kind of having a hefty impact on our standard deviation size, right? So our standard deviation is 40, right? So like all the way out to here, right? So what we want to do is uh, try to get a better, you know, like, un like we want to have better understanding of that data so we can use the percentile, right, which is similar to the median, right, in that, okay, so it looks like the median is about two, okay, so it really means our data is really skewed, because if it's not skewed, right, these will be much closer together. All right, so then... So then we want to make, so we want to uh, take some samples out of this data set uh, to try to get a better understanding of what is the, almost like what's the average of the delays or what can you expect from a prediction perspective. So what do we do? So we can take a sample from the data set and we'll call it the size of it and put in the appropriate number of parentheses. And then over here, what do we use to, uh, what do we use to get the average? I'm actually gonna use mean, but yeah. All right. And then we can just do one Okay, and so when we do 100, we still kind of end up with, we end up with a 15, right? So that's pretty close, that's kind of close to that average. What we want to do is we want to figure out, can we get closer so that we know what the data set looks like? So we can sample it. So basically what we're trying to do is figure out, can we, sorry, I kind of said this badly before, but if we don't know the entire population and we wanted to start to do estimates about it, then this, we want something that is like this, but we want it to be closer to the real population. So we pretend like we don't have the actual full data set and we want it, but we want to get good estimates on. So I don't think this explains very well. All right, so here we just want to add to our array But then we can now run this for 10,000 samples. That's gonna take a second. Oh, that was pretty quick actually. Um, but we just kind of keep adding to our array of averages. And 
So what do we expect that number to look like? All right, sorry, what, what do we, so this is, oh, sorry, this is the actual array. So we end up with the, the array of different averages that we got, and then we have the total number of averages that we did, which we know is about a thousand. Um, and then we could look at the same idea, but let's say, okay, so if we do one with our hundreds, okay, and let's say if we do one with our 400 and with our 900, what do we expect to happen as we raise a piece of code. Right? All right, let's just see if this errors. I don't think I have these, so. Well, it seems to be not, oh, there it goes, okay. Yeah, okay, so. When I was uh, editing this, it looks like I made a mistake when I pulled some stuff out. Um, no, but I don't have, yeah, okay, so. Why? Oh, no, this is just supposed to be like this. My friends are wrong, though. So I think this is still going to error, but let's see. Nope, not because of that. I didn't need, I, I added too many prints. Oh, good call. That would have been a boring error. I like parentheses. If I was doing this in front of me, it would also go a little better. But that's what I was really expecting. Okay, so that sample calc hasn't been done, which I'm not sure where it went because it used to be here. Or not. All right, so that's gonna take a while. All right, so what I wanna show you eventually is that we can do the same thing, and I thought this was, I was gonna have these up here, but basically if we increase the number of samples we take, right, or sorry, we increase the size of the sample, but we still continue to do the same number of samples, we're gonna get really big numbers, which it's not gonna let me print, but as you imagine, right, it's gonna be, a thousand, no, 10,000 raised to the 400, right? So that's gonna be a whole lot. Um, and, but it did look like it finished. So that's good. And so we can see, what do we expect? Okay, so this is our 100. What do we expect the 400 to look like compared to this one? Okay, more ideas? All right, so it should be narrower and taller too, right? However, when we look at it like this, it's, it's pretty hard to tell, right? So, but if you look at the X axis, you can see that the 100 is still pretty like spread out, right? It's a little choppier, whereas the 400 starts to get a little bit more bell curve shaped. 
um, and we see that the numbers are are closer together, right? So this is 12 to 24 versus I think it says five to 35. But instead, and then with the 900, we expect the same thing, except even more, right? So what can we do? Does anybody know how to make this so that we can kind of put them on top of each other? Have you seen this before? So what we can do, this is why we have table means here, is we can conveniently create a table that has them all. And then just label them individually. And then make sure we get the right one in the right place. And then you could probably string this all together, um, but I generally don't uh, because I think it's easier, especially when you can do something like this. All right, so let's put the 400 in there and use the correct values. And then we can do one more with the 900. And now we can see them all together. And now it's really, really obvious, right? That we're going from, you know, point of Y data sets and kind of low to getting narrower and taller, right? And then narrower even more and then even taller, which means that we're getting closer and closer to the actual average of the original population. So if we didn't have the original population, we can actually start to approximate it by calculating it this way, okay? so. We move to the slides from there. And over there too. Nope. All right, so let me just see. Okay. So why do we do this? So this is where the central limit theorem comes in. So it describes how the normal distribution of L-shaped curve is connected to random sample averages. So if we pull out sample averages, they're gonna to start to look like bell-shaped curves if we do kind of enough of them, okay? And so we care about the sample averages because they estimate the population average, which is handy. All right, so the central limit theorem says that if the sample is large, okay, that's the 100 versus 400 versus 900, and drawn at random with replacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability distribution of the sample average is roughly the normal distribution. So in other words, it will be a bell curve. Okay, and that's part of the reason why we care so much about the bell curve is because we can, we can pull this trick, right, and get bell curves a lot, which tells us a lot about the, uh, the average from the samples, which then tells us a lot about the average in the population. Does that make sense? Yeah. They have to be equal in size. So I'm not sure if I know what you mean by sample less than. Sorry, one more time. So this isn't bootstrapping because we're doing we're doing uh, we're doing with replacement. So this is kind of different orders of, of kind of scenarios. The bootstrapping we use when we have a very small observed sample, okay? This is more like we wanna pull out some samples of a larger data set to approximate a much bigger data set. The reason we can't use bootstrapping on this is because we have 13,000 of them, right? So if we try to resample the 13,000s, that's how we end up with those really big numbers, right? So we can't use that technique. I mean, we could, but it would take a month. Right? So instead, we'll find it, we find another way to kind of get to the same goal, but using a different technique. And that one said demo, so I was supposed to switch back. I apparently can't read today, even though it's nice and purple, and I thought you'd, I would notice. All right, so. 
So just by way of explaining it, Okay, so this is basically the same function we had as above, okay, except we're uh, having two variables now. We have a sample size and we have the number of samples. So instead of a hard coded 10,000, uh, we can pass in a value, um, and, but we can still change the sample size, and that'll get us a whole bunch of averages back for the samples that we asked it to take. Let me just catch up so I know what we're looking at. And then I don't think there's anything to add in this function. But basically, this is a function um, which you may not have realized you could do before, but you can actually get, you know, a function which will actually display uh, a graph, right? But so in this case, what it's going to do is actually print information about the distribution, as it says in the lovely comments, and then plot a histogram with the data so that we can kind of uh, basically kind of see how all at once, right? And so... Assuming I ran that correctly. So this shouldn't take very long. So, ah, it's too tall. All right, so when we do the population size, or sorry, the sample size of 100, um, and what do we pass in for the iterations? Uh, 10,000. So this should look very much like the one we did before. Um, but so now we see, right, that the population mean is uh, 16, which is kind of pre-calculated, right? Um, but then the average of the sample means is also about 16. And they're very, very close. And the, but the population of the standard deviation is 39, but the standard deviation of the sample means is 3.9. So it means we're getting, like, kind of tighter in, like, our, our estimation is getting closer to the real thing because we know the standard deviation is small, right? So we're getting closer to the right answer. So the more we can pull this in, the more confidence we have that the estimate of the average is correct. Does that make sense? All right, so then we can kind of do the same thing with This is also missing something um, because we just saw these. Um, but yeah, let's come, let's keep going because we just saw those same histograms a second ago. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so so the the newer function down here has takes two parameters. It takes the sample size and the number of uh, times to do a sample. It's like it's just like the one I had above, except that instead of having hard coded ten thousand, it's taking it as a variable. Um, and basically, then for some reason, I have the exact same thing again except I have a little bit more data here. That's why I was kind of like, maybe we'll just move on um, because we're going to come back to some of that in a minute. Um, but this is kind of the real crux, right? Is that as we increase the sample size and we can actually look at it a little differently too. Um, it's just, they take a long time. Um, let me see if I can get this. Wrong place on the keyboard, sorry. So let's keep this at like 100. Nope, 100. But let's make this only a thousand iterations. Right, and we see this are. Well, <laughs> it's funny because it, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, so the standard deviation is still pretty small. Our average is actually still pretty close. Uh, so I think we got very lucky, unlucky, depending on your perspective. From my perspective, unlucky. Um, but if we, but let's say if we do 400, but only a thousand times. So if you see compared to the 400 up here, 
this was average average of the sample is 16.64 right and the standard deviation is right around two so right around two is the, is the standard deviation and right around 6.61 right is our average so what does that help you conclude that the sample size has more of an impact than the iterations, okay? So, and that's what we were gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, so increasing the sample size improves your, or improves, right, the center, right? So like how much of this stuff is going, like how tall it is, right? And then the spread, which is basically how wide it is. So what we want is narrower and taller. And so if we increase the sample size, that does that way more so than increasing the iterations. Okay. So, and then basically kind of, in other words, right, the probability distribution of the sample average is roughly the normal distribution. When you have this, you know, when you pull out those averages, so this looks a lot like that normal distribution graphic. Uh, it might even be the same one. Um, and then as we increase the sample size, the narrower and taller it gets. Okay. And so obviously this is going to help us start to figure out like when we when we're choosing correctly. All right. So the distribution of the sample average. So imagine all possible random samples. So that's that massive number that we were talking about. And then each of those samples has an average and the distribution of the sample average is the distribution of the averages of all the possible samples. So in other words, we don't need to sample them all. We don't need to take every sample. We can do some of them and get a pretty good idea of the average or whatever we're looking for, right? Um, so it says demo, but I might be a lie. Let me just check. Oh, no, it is. Okay. Hold on a sec. All right. So, oh my goodness, what is going on today? Okay. No, I think we're supposed to do the slide first. Okay. I don't know why I'm so off today, but I really am. Uh, okay, so when we're specifying the distribution, so suppose the sample, random sample is large, we've seen that the distribution of the sample average is roughly bell shaped. But the important questions are where is the center of that bell curve and how wide is that bell curve? And so then we can go to. Okay, so now we'll talk about these real quick. And so this is where the standard deviation starts to help figure out the kind of the sizes of these things and what we're looking for. Um, and so when we see the standard deviation with the 100 sample example, um, we see it's 3.8, right? And then, but with the 400 is 1.9. So obviously the smaller this number, the narrower our, our distribution has gotten, right? Does that make sense? As long as it's roughly bell-shaped. But we know it's roughly bell-shaped because of the central limit theorem. So basically we want to make them smaller so that it will be taller and narrower overall. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but then we can notice some kind of cool stuff, right? Is that we can also, uh, basically when we divide the, the two distributions from each other with the standard deviations, we get about a, whatever that is, two? Yeah, right around two. But look at that, 
Okay, so what we're going to get to is like maybe there's a trick to not actually needing the standard dis distribution for a particular sample size. And specifically, if we take the two sample sizes, so the bigger one, and then divide it by the smaller one, and then we take the overall square root, it seems like we get a number that's really, really close to if we had actually done the work. Does that make sense? Right? Because if, if at all possible, right, we don't, we don't want to do this work, we would rather use this trick to try to figure out, okay, if this was, I don't know, uh, let's say it was 150 and 100, right? This number you imagine is going to be bigger. So therefore, that's not as, as narrow as a, a set of distribution as we want. So, and that's the kind of trick here. Um, and then basically, we can do the same thing with our 900 and 450, but this is going to take a minute. And then obviously that's cooking. This, however, is gated on this, right? But as you see, those two numbers are very, very close. And this is obviously much cheaper to run. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of like the showing your work problem, right? So I'm showing you here about like what, what it's really approximating, but no, that's exactly the point. You want to do this, right? Because it's, it's cheap and easy and gives you a good answer. Um, and so, you know, so obviously if we do this one, that shows us that it's it's a three, right? So that's still, you know, maybe not quite what we're looking for. Like the difference, basically what this is doing is telling us the difference between the quality of the standard deviations, essentially, of doing 900 samples and 450 and 900 and 100. So in other words, like this, this, and I'll show you in a minute, right? Doing 900 will be, give you uh, two thirds more accuracy than doing 100. Okay, that's what this three means, and you'll see it in a second. So, yeah, and uh, I put quotes around this because otherwise I kept reading this in my head as the standard deviation decreases by one, uh, but it doesn't. The standard deviation decreases by one over the square root of a large sample divided by a small sample. So, in other words, you know, here it is kind of in mathematical form, right? And then here's an example that's the same as this one. And so we end up with one third. Okay, so you kind of have to imagine this number as being, you know, one over that number. I mean, I could actually write that, but who knows what the value would be of that. Um, but so it will have a third smaller spread than the hundred sample size. So we can start to estimate where we want to get to by calculating the sample sp spread change before we actually run a sample. So, all right, so what if the sample size is one? Okay, well, that makes it really easy because then the standard deviation would be the same as the populations or in the case of our united data, then the standard deviation is spread around 40. So just kind of imagine the sample size is one. Um, and so even with the 100 case, it's not actually answering that question yet, but I'll throw it in there anyway. Let me just catch up so I can cut and paste if need be. So if we did, ah, where's my mouse? Oh my goodness. All right, so, so if we have a sample size of one and a sample size of 100, these are the two standard deviations, right? So we can divide that out. 
And we can see that's going to give us, it's the same, well, let me do the square root, but it's the same idea as the other one. But so let me do, I think it's that, right? So again, we see that this 100 is going to be basically, you know, call it a third of the width of, the, you know, of the spread of not doing anything. Okay, so if you take sample size one, okay, then which would be a standard deviation of 40, and we do the same over here, we get the with the size 100. That's how much smaller that spread will be. So, but let me go back to the way it was before. All right. Uh, I'm like afraid to run some of these, they take so long. Okay, so, assuming we were doing this 400 with 1,000, or does that say 1,000? No, 10,000. Um, how, like, what's the difference gonna be between this 400 sample and a sample size of 100. How do we figure that out? Yeah. Uh, we can do it simpler than that though. We don't have to have the standard deviation. Because right now I don't, right? Because I haven't actually run it. Right. So we can get this easy mechanism to get to the same value without having to do the work, right? Then we can say, if we do this, the basically the, wait, sorry. Yeah, so now we know that this is gonna be what? A half smaller than the 100. So we know it's gonna be better. Then, yeah, and then we can kind of prove it, but I have to run the calc and all that jazz. Um, so, oh boy, sorry, I just broke my screen. Everything is broken today. Um, So if, but if we do take those standard deviations and do the, divi the division, we can see that interestingly enough, if we do that calculation, we also can see that if we do the square root of the larger sample size, theoretically, that comes out to be pretty close to the same. So if this is our, standard deviation size for the 400, and that's our population standard deviation. If we take the square root of 400, we can get the same, basically the same value as if we had compared the two standard deviations, okay? So this isn't necessarily saying what is the new standard deviation. All it's saying is that it's another way of kind of being able to say, oh, we want, maybe we want a smaller number here and it will get us closer to the truth. Does that make sense? It'll get us a, a better standard deviation than our 40 that we had in our initial population. We are also almost out of time. So let me see if I can wrap this up. So I have a lot more examples that I'll drop in the uh, thing. Um, but so we kind of covered this already. I kind of jumped ahead of my slides, but basically the distribution of the sample average, roughly a bell curve centered at the population average, right? And then why do we care about the variability of the sample average? Because we want the, that center to be as, as close to the actual average as possible. And we want the width of our distribution to be as kind of narrow as possible. Um, and so 
but then we can start to measure the variability of the sample average, or I mean, we are measuring the variability of the sample average so that we know how close we are to the population average. Um, and then this is where kind of we start talking about confidence intervals and that p-value, right, is that how close are we is a way we can measure. We can look at the number of standard deviations we are away and start to get to a confidence interval on our sampling. And let's do this one question and then I think we'll wrap for the day, I think. All right. Um, so same question will be repeated twice. That's awesome that it's cut off. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is fill in the first blank and then on the next question we'll fill in the second blank. Um, I don't know if I can. All right, so the gold histogram shows the distribution of what, basically? Oh, here are the answers. Y'all can see the answers already in the app, right? Yeah, okay. All right, get those answers in. All right, I figured out why this was so broken last time, because it's down below the fold is all. Okay, so let me try to get my sentence back. So the gold histogram shows the distribution of 900 values of, or each of which is, and we'll get to the next question in a second, but it's 900 values. And the question's open, right? Yeah, okay. Oh, sure. So basically you're trying to fill in, oh, I guess I could put the right answer there in the first the gold histogram shows the distribution of 900 values, each of which is a randomly sampled flight delay or an average of flight delays. So what is each one of those 900 things? All right, get those answers in because I want to do one more slide before we call it. Which basically elaborates on these questions. All right, let's call it there. And the correct answer, if I can show it to you, is an average of flight delay. So it's basically, it's each one of those samples and then averaged uh, uh, average delays, right? That's what the 900 represents. And then, so basically here's kind of the overview of those two diagrams. So the gold histogram shows the distribution of 10,000 values, each of which is an average of 900 randomly sampled flight delays. And the blue histogram shows the distribution of 10,000 values, each of which is an average of 400 randomly sampled flight delays. And both are roughly bell-shaped. The larger the sample size, the narrower the bell. And that's why we care, right? And I think that's it for today.